I've never thought I'd see the day where rioters and looters would be portrayed as the good guys and law enforcement as the bad guys. Senator John Cook is the senator from Weld County, Colorado, and also, watch out, he's a former cop. I know you're supposed to say sheriff, but in my mind, all you guys have badges and, <laughs> and, and guns. You want to see mine? No, not anymore. <laughs> I've, I've seen yours too many times over the years. Um, r real quickly, just so people um, get the difference between a sheriff's office and a police department, because I, I really think there's a world of difference between the two. What is that difference? Well, the main difference is sheriffs are elected, which means they're accountable to the public and to the public only. Um, so the commissioners can give the sheriff his budget or her budget. The county commissioners. The county commissioners. And uh, after that, they can't even tell them how to spend it. They have no uh, say in how the sheriff runs his or her office, where a police chief is a department head. And he answers to a mayor or a city council um, or a city manager. And so he really uh, doesn't have the autonomy let, that let, a sheriff let me, does. Let me run this by you. Um, I believe a lot of the uh, public relations problems that cities particularly have, urban cities have uh, with police, is because of this difference. Um, when, back when you were a sheriff, when one of your guys, called deputies, pulled somebody over or was interacting with somebody in, in public, that was a voter. And so if they screwed up, they were going to express that by voting against you. Correct. Um, but when a cop pulls somebody over or deals with somebody in the public, their boss has only one constituent. In Denver, it's the mayor. Maybe it's the city manager. In some places, maybe it's the whole town council, but really not. So you have one constituent. And I think it, it really distances them from the, the people they're here to protect. I've always said that chiefs of police, like sheriffs, should be elected. If that happened, particularly in, in cities, would that be a positive move from your point of view? Oh, I think so. Uh, because, again, they would have autonomy from the city council, the mayor, um, or the city manager. And I, it's when I fired somebody, they stayed fired. You know, if they did something wrong, um, they weren't coming back. Where in the police department, they have civil service, they you know have unions, they have all these uh, uh, things in between. Talk to me about the unions, because as a sheriff, well, county, it was not a small department uh, or office. 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 Sorry, <laughs> no offense intended. Uh, that there, there really wasn't the union issue that we have throughout these big cities where we're seeing seeing protests. Correct. Yeah, most I don't think there's a sheriff's office in the state other than Denver, and the Denver is a true sheriff's department because the sheriff is not elected, and he reports to the director of public safety. And his job is to take care of the jails. They don't do policing. They, they, they take care of bad guys once they're caught. That's correct. Denver uh, Sheriff's uh, Department just um, covers the jail and courthouse security and then transports and civil process. But other than that, they don't do any law enforcement on the street. It's all of the city. Do you think changing it from an elected, from a, a appointed chief of police to elected is enough, or do we also need to do something about the unions in the cities? Yeah, I think that would be a good step is if you elect police chiefs. It's not unheard of. There's a couple in Texas that the police chiefs are actually elected. So there are some around here. You know, I think the unions um, have a little bit of too much power, and I think we need to kind of take a look at, you know, what they do. Because most unions, what they do is they protect, you know, their employees, and that's their main function. Unions today protect the lowest element instead of helping the the best elements go forward. At least that, that's, I've seen it in, in public education. I've seen it in, in uh, police departments and fire departments. It's, they're not there just to collectively bargain. Correct. And, you know, and they do have some good aspects. They want to make sure that due process is followed for their, for their officers. I mean, and I believe in due process. Everybody else is entitled to it and gets it. So, you know, uh, law enforcement should too. So they want to make sure the officers uh, get their due process. But at that point, they need to be willing to cut a, a bad officer uh, go and let them just uh, say, you know what, we're not going to support you because um, you really screwed up. You're now, you've been a um, senator now for what, has it been six years six already? Six years, six oh sessions. Oh my lord, yeah. oh my lord, all right. Time flies. So you have become the go-to guy, particularly in the Senate, but I think throughout the Capitol, 
uh, for, for law enforcement issues. Whenever there's a bill that, that has anything, well, I know what Cook says. You know, and so you, know, you, get to be, you, get, you get to be the top cop on that. This year, there were a lot of bills, particularly after the, the riots, after all this stuff, that we needed police reform. Uh, a bill came forward. You were very against it. What did it do, and then how did it change? Well, it uh, yeah, it was uh, Senate Bill two seventeen, and they called it restoring integrity in law enforcement. You know, I, I, I can look <laughs> in your eyes and see how insulting you even found that restoring integrity. Right. Because how long were you in law enforcement? Thirty years, a little over thirty years, actually. Okay. Yeah. And I know you personally have very little integrity, but professionally, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but professionally, um, when you see a bill that says restoring integrity. What, what does that mean to, to every, everybody who's been a cop, everyone who's married to a cop? Um, it, what does it mean? Well, it means uh, that the people that are uh, sponsoring the bill don't think law enforcement has any integrity at all. And so they feel like they have the job or the duty to bring re, uh, integrity to law enforcement when my argument is 99.9% .9 of law enforcement and law enforcement agencies have the utmost and highest amount of integrity and want to do the good job and want to uh, enforce the law equally and with justice and, and fairness to everybody. I've heard people say that, that, there is a, that there is institutional racism in law enforcement. I've heard it from my black friends who say even black cops have an institutional racism by the job that they have. That policing really started with uh, policing black people, keeping people in their place, keeping slaves held to their slave owners. That policing was really about that. And generation after generation, uh, those values get passed down. That uh, fathers who have kids and their cops, their kids often become cops. Give me, give me your response. No, uh, that's, uh, my opinion, is hogwash and couldn't be further from the truth. Um, law enforcement was started way before you know, the institution of slavery. We have recorded sheriffs back in England in the 700s and 800s, uh, you know, A.D. Um, I, I just the sheriff of Nottingham, not a good cat. <laughs> but he was after uh, Robin Hood, you know, and a, 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 who was a, uh, a socialist. Thief. Yeah, socialist. A socialist. Right. Socialist. right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I just think that's uh, it's a good tagline to to promote um, wh what somebody's narrative is. And uh, I have not seen institutional racism in law enforcement in my over thirty years of uh, of, of law enforcement. Uh, I Do you just, believe that overall, and mind you, maybe Weld County is different than, than downtown Denver, but are, are people in communities that are policed, are they policed the same way? If you, know, if you know this neighborhood is a different neighborhood than that neighborhood, you, are they policed the same? Well, no, because they're, every neighborhood is different. You're going to have higher crime rates in certain neighborhoods versus others. So you're going to concentrate your uh, resources into the neighborhoods that have a higher crime rate or where these, the uh, community wants law enforcement in, uh, into a, com a certain community because the crime rate's higher. So they call and say, hey, we need more police protection in maybe a disadvantaged neighborhood, more so than a Cherry Creek neighborhood. So the, you can't police the whole city uh, in the same way because you're going to have to uh, devote resources to the community differently. So when you, when you hear that um, we need to restore integrity, as this bill did, what did they want to do to restore integrity? What, what, what in their mind meant restoring integrity? Uh, punishing the police is what uh, was in their mind when the bill was introduced. It was called... Who introduced it? Um, in the Senate, it was Senator, uh, President uh, Leroy Garcia and Rhonda Fields, a uh, senator from Aurora. And those were the two uh, Senate sponsors, and it started in the Senate. And when I was asked about it, I said, this is a revenge bill. It is a punishment bill against law enforcement. It was an anti-law enforcement uh, bill. And to a couple of close friends, it was like, hmm, you know, yeah. the police bill. Why? What did it do? Oh, you just did. don't want integrity, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it. Well, the punishment part and revenge part was uh, there's a, such a thing in our in um, in our law, good faith. So if an officer operates in good faith and you know violates somebody's constitutional rights, that may sound kind of like a contradiction, but it really isn't. So if 
three witnesses come up to me and say, hey, the, we saw this person commit this crime, and you go get a search warrant, and you get a judge to sign the search warrant, and you go arrest the person, now you're depriving them of their, you know, their Fourth Amendment rights. But then it turns out not to be the person. The, that officer operated in good faith. He got the wrong guy, but it was, but it was in good faith. Right, based on the information that the officer had. Um, or there's a, the example, dark alley at night, 2 a.m. in the morning, somebody reports like a robbery, you contact somebody that matches the description, you tell the person to stop, that person doesn't, so you tell him, keep your hands where I can see him, he reaches into his pocket to grab something, and the officer shoots him. I mean, th that he's operating in good faith, thinking that his life is in danger. And that happens, not often, but it, I mean, it happens. What would this bill have done? That bill would have taken out the good faith exception from uh, defense on any violation. And it would also have took out the uh, qualified immunity, which is largely misunderstood. But the, the main thing I was to die on the hill for was to keep the good faith exception in there, and that had to stay in. And that was just one part of this bad bill. As and, the, and the idea was that um, if a cop is acting in good faith, he's not guilty of a higher level crime. It doesn't mean that he's free and clear, does it? I mean, there are repercussions when he makes a mistake, even if it was done in good faith. Yeah, there could be. Um, you know, there's every, everything an officer does is scrutinized by, you know, the media or the, uh, the, the sergeant and the, on up the chain of command uh, by the courts. Um, and so there could be other consequences. Even if you make a mistake that's so egregious, you might lose your job. Uh, you might not be civilly liable, uh, but uh, you could be. You might not be criminally charged, uh, but you could be. But the probability is lower. You were able to get that taken out of, out of the bill. That was, that was the, big, the big one. Talk to me a little bit about the immunity issue, because I keep hearing this over and over again, and I'm somewhat convinced of, of some of the merits, which is if a cop is held personally liable for his misconduct, uh, he is going to act a whole lot better. When he knows that the government is going to pay all of his civil um, fines, so the family is going to sue me, I'm not going to lose anything. I'm not even going to lose some of anything uh, because the city's going to do it. And I look at what Denver has paid out over the last several years in these type of claims. I could, I could pay attention to this idea that, well, maybe the guy who did it should be somewhat liable, if not completely liable. Well, to begin with, you cannot intentionally violate somebody's constitutional right and have qualified immunity. You know, the, the cops up in uh, Minneapolis, they're not getting qualified immunity because that was an intentional act. And uh, probably the, pers the officers down in um, Atlanta, Georgia, they probably aren't going to get qualified immunity because they were op operating outside their normal uh, police duties or, or uh, policies and procedures. So they are going to be held civilly um, responsible in, in, in a federal court, civil rights uh, violations. You've never had qualified immunity in a 1983 uh, civil rights action in a federal court. You, um, there's always a possibility of personal damages against you. So if you don't intentionally violate somebody's constitutional rights, you make a mistake, um, then you do have qualified immunity from uh, being sued. And the city or the county indemnifies you to pay for that. Otherwise, um, you're not going to you know, get very many law enforcement officers out there to, willing to get a job or then stay on the job, because if now they're responsible um, for any mistake that they make personally, they're operating under the colors of their, of their position and of the city or county, um, they just won't do anything. So what happened on 217 with, it, with qualified immunity? Well, that was taken, that was left in the bill that it's not a defense, but originally it was $100,000 that the officer was uh, liable for first, and then the city can ident or county could identify them after the 100000 but the officer or deputy could not even buy insurance, and the uh, to like you know doctors, lawyers, they all make mistakes, and they, they, they have insurance. Yeah, right. They have insurance to cover those mistakes. Well, the bill originally said you can't even buy malpractice insurance um, and have them cover that hundred thousand dollars. So that was another hill to die on, and the the finished bill came out to twenty five thousand dollars. But um, you can get insurance, and if the officer can't pay the twenty five thousand then the city can go ahead and do it. Okay. So it, it brings some financial pressure on cops. 
uh, but it doesn't. It, it's not going to destroy them, and they can get insurance. Right. It, it won't bankrupt them. They won't lose their home. You know, they'll be able to send their kids to college, hopefully. But yes, they can get insurance. So what is the bill that you ended up signing off on? What does it do? Well, there were so many components on the original bill. There was body camera issues. Um, there was, like, every cop, every agency had to have body cameras by a certain date. And the body cameras, the cameras themselves are, aren't that expensive. It's the storage that it really adds up. And a lot of vendors actually were giving the cameras away for free if you use their system. Give away the razor, sell the blades. Right, exactly, exactly. And the other part of it was that all footage had to be released regardless, um, unedited, unredacted, released within seven days. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. There's privacy issues. You, if an officer goes into a sex assault on a child and there's a naked child there, in the original bill, that had to be released. Um, if, you, if the officer was covering a murder scene and you're talking to the officer's talking to a witness and the witness says, yeah, this is the person that murdered this guy, now that's released to the public. And so the murderer knows who Ooh. the witness is and is like, hey, I need to go right. whack this guy. Um, so there was a lot of issues. And uh, it, what happened was now we have, I think it's uh, 21 days or 28 days, and you can redact it um, so that you're not releasing personal information. You're not releasing victim information. And it, the other part of the problem with the body cams originally was you couldn't shut it off, basically. So if the officer went to go to the restroom, <laughs> you get that yeah, too. yeah, you, yeah. You, um, so there were a lot of issues on that, and now you can turn it off. And they have, there are certain you know, requirements that you have to turn it on. At, you know, when you're interacting with uh, the public. Can on you understand the issues. frustration though that there have been a lot of uh, uh, police video footage that hasn't been released, sure. uh, particularly in Denver. Um, you know, that there's a frustration and that there's a lack of transparency when it comes to these cases. Absolutely, I, I understand that all uh, totally. And, you know, I've always said, I sponsored a, a bill in 2015 for body cams, and I've always said that body cameras exonerate law enforcement more so than they indict them. And I, I've, I've heard that almost universally from every cop I've ever talked to. Mm -hmm. uh, I have yet to find a cop who looks at their camera and goes, I, I hate this thing. Uh, I've had a couple say, this thing has saved my bacon. Right. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I think the reason agencies don't have them right now is because of the cost. And we extended in this bill out to 2023 for agencies to prepare and to buy the body cameras. But, you know, I've heard some officers say, oh, God, I hated these things when I first got them, but now I love them because you're right. They saved my bacon. Uh, when somebody makes a complaint, you know, they'll pull out the body camera. They'll say, they'll show the, the, uh, the footage to the person making the complaint. And usually it's, you know, the person making the complaint that was, you know, irate, upset, saying things, doing things that they probably shouldn't have. Would you have voted for this bill as it came out if not for this moment in history? I mean, there's no question in my mind this was a quick reaction to what was going on in a session that was supposed to only have bills that were fast, free, and friendly. friendly. Financially friendly, yes. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden this came out, and it, it seemed like a politically opportunistic bill for a lot of folks. If, if this was just a normal year without the riots, without the Black Lives Matter uh, reaction, would, would you still have put your name on it? You know, I think I would have, and I, I think we had this bill, not the riots didn't, you know, um, pass this bill. You know, the protests weren't passing this bill. Uh, it was what happened up in Min uh, Minneapolis that the bill was introduced. And you're right, it was uh, rammed through pretty quickly. It's still not perfect. It still needs some work. And uh, But I think in the end, um, I probably would have still supported the bill. In, like in 2015, we had a whole series because Ferguson was going on. And we had a whole series of what I called anti-law enforcement bills. And I worked with uh, the sponsors in the House and in the Senate, and we actually killed nine of them. And um, I worked with them on three others and got those passed and came up with uh, some other bills. Um, so I think this was, in the end, a good bill that I could have supported. And in committee, I voted, I said, I'm going to vote no. And I'm hoping there's a lot of changes so that I can vote yes on second and third readings. And um, pretty much they listened to myself and Bob Gardner. And the whole bill was completely changed to about 90% of it. As sheriff, one of your jobs was hiring. Hiring and firing. Correct. And you got to make the call, right? Yes. It came out to you. I hire, I fire, because uh, you're, you're, you're the sheriff. If you are still sheriff today, how easy would it be for you to hire? 
Not very easy. It, it's very difficult. When I started in law enforcement, there might be two or three openings in a particular agency. You could have three to four hundred people applying for those two or three jobs. When, uh, when the last time I was sheriff and we opened up to patrol, we had a couple of openings. Fifteen people applied. So, you know, I think a lot of people look at law enforcement. Why what are you I, hearing now? You must, you must still have friends in, in the business. Are, are, oh. I mean, are, who the hell wants to be a cop? Right now, you are hated, you will be yelled at, you will be spit upon, you'll have things thrown at you, and you've got to keep your cool and composure right. during all this. I've never thought I'd see the day where rioters and looters would be portrayed as the good guys and law enforcement as the bad guys. And you're right, who would want to be a cop under these conditions? Um, work midnights, have you know Tuesday, Wednesdays off, miss Christmas, you know, not be with your family on birthdays and anniversaries, fight with drunks in the middle of the night. Um, who would want to do that right now? And the ones that are applying, their backgrounds are so bad that... How do you mean? Well, they, they like, uh, they'll like commit a crime and, um, you know, oh, now all of a sudden, a couple of months later, oh, I want to be a cop. Right. Yeah. Or they'll like do coke and, you know, snort cocaine and, and oh, you know, now I've changed and I only snor uh, snorted coke a month ago, but, you know, now I want to be a cop. And so there's, we find out a lot of, uh, you know, bad backgrounds, you know, thefts. Uh, we've had people apply that, um, that hadn't been caught, but admitted to sexual assault, uh, admitted to child pornography, uh, peeping. And so you just look at some and of these backgrounds. If that say, ever comes out. Yeah. That's why we're really big on uh, background investigation. So uh, we would send people out of state if somebody was a viable candidate. We'd send somebody to do a you know, background check in the, in their, uh, the state that where they're coming from. Uh, it's quite the process. And, you know, psychological exams, uh, physical exams, written, uh, mental. Let's, let's finish it up on this. So out in Minneapolis, uh, they are disbanding the police. Um, which is odd because I remember them from the 80s and I never liked their music anyway, so I thought they broke up. <laughs> but now they're not saying they're, this, this chant to defund the police is interesting. And as a fiscal conservative, I like defunding lots of good stuff. I don't think we agree on what that means. They're going to try to replace this with um, uh, social workers who are going to come in when there's you know, a, a person who has a drug problem instead of bringing a cop in. What does it mean, and, and how, do, how do you see it working from, from your law enforcement? And once you're blue, you never go back. I That's know right. This. Once a sheriff, always a sheriff. Yeah. As a matter of fact, most of the senators uh, down still at the... Still call uh, you sheriff. Still call me sheriff. It's a much harder they're calling. Still, they're still trying to get you to get them out of parking <laughs> tickets. Right. So. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, st I, I too don't know what uh, defunding the police mean. Is, does that mean doing away with the police completely? Um, or does it mean, like you said, uh, sending in social workers when there's a, uh, some kind of alcohol or drug-related incident? Does that mean a social worker is going to go into a domestic violence? Because most domestic violence is uh, somebody's been drinking or somebody's been doing drugs. And does that mean a social worker is going to go in there and calm the person down and you know, solve the situation? I don't think so. Um, somebody's probably going to go to jail because in a domestic violence, you usually have an assault of some kind. So uh, I, I don't see it working very well. I think a lot of the cops um, are saying, okay, you know, you can have all that stuff, but don't call us when it doesn't work. You know, we're, uh, we're not social workers to begin with, but if it doesn't work, don't, uh, don't be calling us back. Yeah, I, I see on the side of the police car, you know, serve and protect, serve and protect. You know, I think most cops watch Starch, Ski, and Hutch like I did as a kid <laughs> and go, oh, man, I want to catch those bad guys. <laughs> Not knowing that really what they're going to spend most of their time on uh, is really ugly uh, domestic violence situations and drunk situations and cleaning up homeless people and, and it, um, being mostly a first responder for, for, from heart attacks to, to petty crimes. Um, if somebody wants to be a cop, what is like the biggest surprise to them from what they thought about to the reality of the situation? Well, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It, you see all these cop shows, and it's like CSI even, or you see Law and Order, and you think, yes, I'm, you know, I've got a big red S on my chest, and I'm going to go out and save the world. And when you get out actually on the job, it's you know, like 98% uh, boredom and 2% sheer terror kind of a thing. Um, you, you realize that 
that's not your everyday experience. You're, most, you're, you're, you're going to be dealing with people that are the bad people and the people that are upset for most of your time because you pull somebody over for you know speeding, that, that doesn't make them a bad person, but they're upset because getting, they're getting right. pulled over and getting a ticket. So they're, they're upset with you. you. Then you deal with the bad elements of, of uh, society as well. So uh, you're not out there. You, you can't save the world. Uh, you want to, but you realize uh, uh, very quickly that you can't right. do it. Now, this will be really the last question, which is bad cops. And I'm not talking about cops on the take. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about jerk cops. Mm -hmm. And I know you people don't believe they exist, but on the consumer <laughs> side, let me tell you, I get tired of jerk cops. Yeah. And I can understand some people you know, who are minorities going, I am always getting pulled over. I'm always getting this. And that there is a petty tyrant type of thing that goes right. on with some guys when they put on a badge, whether they're a TSA agent and they, you know, they get to have their power strip or they're, they're a cop and, you, and they do so much damage and they're much more prevalent than I think um, we want to say. No, you're absolutely right. I, I agree. There are jerk cops. I mean, just like there's jerk anything. But the problem is, when these you're guys a cop, are carrying guns and yeah, have the authority to arrest to, people and you know take away their freedoms and and to absolutely. detain them and stop them. And we've been trained to respect them, right. but they're jerks. Right. No, you, you're absolutely right. And those are the ones that we need to weed out. And as sheriff, um, I I think I did a pretty good job of that um, because we don't want those kind of people. I had a woman come up to me. At, uh, at a fallen officer memorial and said, man, I love your deputies. They do a great job. They work hard for you. They bend over backwards. They're personable. But these cops from this other agency, um, I won't tell you exactly what she said, but I don't like them. And they're a bunch of whatever. Um, and I think, as, at least on the, law, the sheriff's side, we can have that ability to weed out those jerk cops because we don't want them out there. And unfortunately, once somebody gets past a, like a year of probation in City law enforcement, the it's union. really difficult to get rid of them. You Isn't know? it amazing that yeah. finally the left is going, you know, unions are really bad for protecting bad employees, which is dangerous when it comes to police. School unions, however, oh, that's They're all right, good. because, you know, bad yeah. teachers don't cause any damage. I had several Democrats come up to me and say, we need to do something about police unions. And this is right after, literally, right after they passed the bill to allow state employees to unionize. <laughs> so, so I go, Wait a minute. So union, state employees, good. Police unions, bad. Um, you, know, you run that bill and see what happens. That's the perfect way to leave it. <laughs> Senator, thank you so much. You bet. Thank you, John. It's good seeing you again. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.